Good morning. This is Stan in Gainesville, Florida, and you are listening to Light Talk. Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas, and today we are going to talk about conventional lights being DOA to the theater, <laughs> CAD, and some layers of light on Light Talk. And this is David in the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk. And we are the Lumen Brothers. Lumens. Lumens. So, hey, uh, next week we have a very special gift to all of our listeners out there, every single one of you. Next week we will be broadcasting our second annual Christmas Extravaganza. And our beloved Lumen sister, Ann McMills, will be joining us. Yay. So, <laughs> so it looks like a lot of fun. We'll have some very special Yuletide surprises. And you know something, boys and girls? Santa may be stopping by our studios at Light Talk Central just for you. Which studio? Which studio? Light Talk Central. Light Talk Central is in Gainesville. Oh, That's, okay. Well, good. I'll, I'll be sure to keep the chimney keep open. Keep the chimney open. Open the flue. You don't want that flue <laughs> closed because you don't want a big fat man stuck in your chimney. It's for too the bad we don't have a chimney. We'll have to have him come down the light tubes. <laughs> the light tubes. Well, it's a, he could be Lumen Santa Claus. Lumen Santa Well, we, we do have light tubes in the house, so he can slide down those two light chimneys. He could come in as Lumen Energy. He could be like, he could be like a hologram Santa. Ooh. Anyway, I'm getting, we're, we're getting off track. Are you going to leave cookies and milk for Santa this year? Uh, I will. 2% milk. You have to be careful when you leave that note. Because Santa, if you're not careful, can also spell Satan. Ooh, that's true. You know what? You, when I misspell my name sometimes, <laughs> it looks like <laughs> Satan. <laughs> well, first of all, Santa does not drink 2% milk, Stan. Oh, no. I have to give him whole milk? It's got to be the creamy, creamy milk. How about almond milk? Almond milk? How do you make milk yeah. out of an almond? I don't know. They just do it. They squeeze the almonds. I don't almonds know. Almonds have no udders, okay? That I know for a fact. <laughs> but getting back to, he doesn't drink 2% milk, and you got to make sure the cookies are freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. Kosher? Uh, you want to bless it by a rabbi, bless it by a rabbi. Okay. I know a moil who, do, who does that really cheap. Well, there's no pork. In a, you know what? We had some fantastic cookies made by one of our costume students last week, and I got the recipe. It's fantastic. Best cookies I've ever had. Oh, send me the recipe. I love cookies. Anyway. I might, I'll have to ask permission. We're off track. I know, as usual. <laughs> We're talking about Christmas. But you know something for our Jewish friends, our own two personal Jews, Stan and me, will be performing Oops. our special dreidel song <clears throat> so grab a glass of eggnog put on your tacky christmas sweater light a fire and join us next week for light talk episode 89 baby it's cold outside so let's spend christmas with the lumen brothers so, <laughs> okay you've heard about I that pra- latest. i bet do I the lyrics to that song i better get going there'll be new lyrics oh. to the song can i ask the first question already ask the first question stan Oh, well, here's our first question. It comes from Susan in Sweden. And Susan in Sweden is asking, are conventional tungsten fixtures dead? Well, only if they're unplugged or the lamp is burned out. <laughs> um, so, you know, uh, I, let me just flip this question a little bit and say, are candles dead? You know, so maybe gas lighting is dead. Uh, maybe it isn't. But some things are just going to slowly get used less. Some things are going to become a specialty item. Uh, I think it's going to take a long time for them to be completely dead. Um, I think about it in terms of, let's say, fluorescent tubes, right, which are ubiquitous across the architectural world. Have all of them been replaced? No. Is it going to happen? I remember at a conference I was at one time, and the, the guy speaking said, you know, if you took all the fluorescent tubes in the world out of commission... You'd, every one of those tubes has a drop of mercury in it. You'd have a lot of mercury you'd have to dispose of safely. So the good thing about tungsten lamps is they're pretty much recyclable. It's glass, tungsten, and tin. So I don't know if they're dead. I think I think they may be on life support or they may be starting to shift. I think I still think it's expensive. You know, based on the conversation we had at ETCQ last year, on that Q, the workshop rather. 
we asked sort of people about, you know, are they seeing more rigs with moving lights and less conventional fixtures? And the answer surprised me that not so much, not yet. So I think if I had to, if I had to take a stand on it, say they're not dead yet. They're still out there. And in some of the, in some of the projects that we do, uh, clients say, if we're doing a new project from the ground up, we probably don't do much tungsten. Um, if we're doing a retrofit um, or a particular situation where a lot of the incoming tours still want to use tungsten. So we have to sort of provide opportunity for both solid state lighting as well as tungsten. So I don't think they're dead yet. I'm not dead yet. They're dead as a damn doornail. So Susie in Sweden, you know better than us. The EU introduced legislation in 2009 that banned the sale of tungsten lighting for domestic use. So they were taking that out of homes. They've now started taking that out of commercial institutions, and this year they've introduced legislation to take tungsten out of theaters. And this is going to be a a major problem. It's going to be a problem for a couple reasons. Um, So one, we can argue the the idea of the the artistic um, quality of a tungsten lamp, but it's going to be a real problem for theaters that can't afford to take that equipment out and completely retrofit their theater to an LED fixture. That's right. So I, I would say tungsten's dead. And I would take a look at ETC as the marker for that. I was doing some rough numbers, and I, I, I'm not positive this is true. I think it is, but ETC, feel free to weigh in and say, you're out of your mind. Or they may say, we're not going to tell you. But I think since the Source 4 has been introduced, ETC has sold a million units worldwide. I'm asking, why are they retrofitting all these units now with the source forward? They see the handwriting on the wall. Tungsten is, is, is just on its way out. I mean, there's some uh, pros for using a tungsten fixture. You have a high CRI with it. It does provide really great color rendering. You can plug them into a dimmer, forget about it, and turn them on. They are low cost. They're extremely easy to maintain. They have a high output, and they have no fans on board. So... Tungsten got a lot of pros, but there's some cons also. They get extremely hot. They have a short lamp life. You're going to have to have gel to color mix with them. And multiple fixtures are needed if you want multiple colors on stage. Also, they're not very efficient in delivering that light to the stage. So that brings us to the uh, LED world. LEDs, you already, you already know this. Long life you know, up to 50 times uh, the lamp life of uh, a tungsten halogen. They're very bright. They're getting brighter every day. The CRI is improving. They do color saturation quite well, and they're more efficient in energy uh, to use than a tungsten halogen, though I think that's a smoke and mirror um, argument. Uh, This idea that if you switch your theater over from tungsten to LED, all of a sudden your energy bills are going to go down. I'm not so convinced about that. We rarely use tungsten halogen lamps uh, at their peak uh, energy output. We also use them for short periods of time over, let's say in my instance, a school year, or even let's say a regional theater. You're not turning those things on and off every day, and you're not running them at 100%. So I don't know if those benefits are quite what um, salesmen are telling us, but, but LEDs are more efficient. Lower heat generation, and they're great if you want to replace a psych or a wash system. So PARs, Fresnels, strips, I think LEDs are fantastic. The cons, uh, fan noise. Uh, LEDs do generate heat. It just comes out the back, not the front. Uh, LEDs are heavy, and that comes in the form of a heat sink on board the unit. And getting back to where I started, if you're a small theater and someone's just told you to pull out 100 lights and replace them with 100 LED fixtures, then you have a high investment cost right up front. And I I think some people won't be able to do that. They're difficult and expensive to repair, and they're difficult to color match. You know, you can talk to David about his color matching theories on LEDs. LEDs aren't a big deal. If you're you're doing rock and roll, more power to you. But if you're sitting beside the costume designer in the front row, then you've got some problems on your hand when you start color matching. So tungsten's DOA. They're going to be gone in 10 years. Wow, I agree with Steve. I'm looking at my own work. Now, I, I do work at a lot of theaters that have a lot of money. 
So it's really not a, a concern for a lot of the shows that I do. But I'm looking back on my last two or three years, and I may have used only a handful of tungsten lamps. Everything is either moving lights, and they're either LED or they're discharge, or they're LED leakos. I just find it a lot more useful. My whole design process is changing because I'm thinking of light totally different with a lot more opportunities to, to manipulate the color of the light over time. And LED, and, and obviously if you have some sort of color changing mechanism in the light, those are the only ways of doing it. You need that. You can't do it with a tungsten light that has an R64 in it. Uh, that You're stuck. As you dim it down, the light will change color and it'll change color according to the physics of the light dimming down. So yeah, I'm afraid that it's a DOA in the sense of if you're going to buy new equipment now, you better buy LED or you better buy something with a color changing mechanism. I, I think tungsten is definitely on its way up. You know, I just did a cherry orchard in the Garson Theater and you know that space, David. Oh yeah. And, and I hung about 100 lights in there and I way overhung that show. <laughs> and what I found that I used for uh, almost 100% of the show were 24 movers and 16 LED fixtures. So I just wasted people's time hanging all the incandescent fixtures. Yeah. I think Steve's point about the variance of usage in theater is, 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 can't be over, overstated. That's true. It's a big difference. And just as an as a, as a interesting piece of data to get your head around, the incandescent lamp from an energy perspective is 90% heat and 10% light for the energy consumed. So just let that sit in the brain for a minute. Let me just address the rendering thing and put this into another venue. So I did a lot of work in museums. Museums are probably the most critical place for rendering because they want truthiness, which I think still is a, very, is a variable in terms of how a work of art or a painting looks because we might ask where, under what light condition was the painting made, which might be the way you want to render it. What was the artist, what, what photonic energy did the artist have when he was painting that? But in terms of usage, it's a little different than us because they turn them on and then they stay on all day. Although in certain situations for conservation, uh, if there's money to do it, they will be triggered by motion sensors. So the, the best conservation of a work of art is no light. So there's no point in having light on a work when there's no one in the gallery viewing it. And when art is stored, it's stored in the dark to protect it. But I guess my, my larger point is that, that energy perspective in the LED fixture, there's, we discovered, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post a link to this gateway project from the Department of Energy that we did at UF. There's something called the ghost load. So for example, we did this work, we had uh, the Department of Energy set up an internet connection from here to Portland, Oregon. They were collecting all the data for three months on both architectural fixtures that we changed out, and also we did a, a dance piece that we did both with tungsten and gel, and then we did it with LED, and we also surveyed the audience. It's a pretty extensive study. It took us about a year and a half to do. Because that was a really big question a few years ago. But here's the one thing that was a takeaway. One manufacturer had the energy consumption in their spec sheet about what consumption would be. When we were getting the final data back from the lab, which was done with, at um, uh, Pacific Northwest National Laboratories in Portland, the data conflicted, and we were about to publish. And so I reached out to the manufacturer of that particular fixture and said, you know, we're about to publish this data and we're going to have to say in this document that what you say is not what's real. And we didn't want to insult that manufacturer. What came out of that uh, due diligence was that they did not include ghost load. So Steve's point, when you turn off that, that tungsten fixture, it's truly off. When you turn off that LED fixture, it's not off unless you literally kill power to it. Some of the new systems, when they're not getting data, turn to, they have a smart circuit breaker and turns it all. But, but ghost load, meaning the fan, the computer, the PCBs that are running in that fixture are still getting power. And, and one might not be very much, but if it's 100 or 200, it is. So there is a sort of a, uh, let's just say, a fuzzy space about the consumption. So yes, if you look at it like Steve said, yeah, it's not... 80% more efficient if it's at full all the time, blah, 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 blah. So there is a variance. Most of the theater consultants I know feel like if you're, if you're putting in something brand new in a building, you might as well, right? 
uh, it, it makes sense. If you're doing a retrofit or a renovation and there's a lot of equipment in place, then it becomes a different, a different, a different conversation. Got a question here from Robert in Texas. And he says, I'm having some trouble managing constant changes and the stress that comes along with that. Any suggestions? Well, changes are part of a designer's life. I mean, if you look at uh, the definition of of designer, you know, uh, I could argue we're not artists, we're problem solvers. So you're going to have change coming at you right through opening night and then maybe thereafter if they're willing to pay you to be there. But I think as far as stress goes... The the first thing I would say is learn how to breathe. Just take a breath every mm-hmm. now and then. One of the things you're going to notice if you get really stressed out or frustrated or even angry, uh, you're going to feel your body heating up. And one of the things you can do immediately to start calming yourself down is just to breathe through your mouth. Just a little breath like you're breathing through a straw, and that'll bring cool air in, exhale through the nose, four or five breaths, and you'll feel your body starting to uh, to uh, calm down. You're kind of hitting the pause button on anger and frustration. Uh, you know, as far as, uh, let's say, tech, because tech is where a lot of stress happens, uh, and maybe the day after tech, when you're trying to do some notes, I would say if you find yourself getting stressed again, do one small thing that you can accomplish. So instead of trying to figure out how to relight Act 4 because the director (laughs) hates it, go back to Act 3, where he or she said, you know, that count needs to be a little slower. (laughs) Do a a couple small things that you succeed at before you're just banging your head against the wall against something that's going to be really kind of monumental. I would also say uh, when you're in the rehearsal period there, when you're in tech, when you're in dress, you're sitting in a chair, which is never going to be comfortable for a long period of time. Uh, The thing that I learned because I used to fly a lot, was stretching in my airplane seat. I mean, you can cross your arm across your body and stretch. You can reverse that. So I mean, four or five minutes of stretching at the tech table, and that's also going to kind of uh, relax your body a little bit. Also, um, and um, actually, I'm going to save this because I know David's going to want to address (laughs) this. Uh, I would say accept that uh, stress is part of your life. And I have two things. So this is from my friends in China. I was at the National Theater, and they said, you seem very upset. (laughs) And I I said, well, yes, I am. And they took my hand, and they held my hand up in the air, and they took my thumb, and they took my thumb, and I pressed my middle finger on the same hand. And they said, either they they probably went to the soda machine and said, look at that fool, he'll do anything. (laughs) But... I was took my thumb, I pressed it against my middle finger, and they said that was the pressure point to help the body relieve yourself of stress. So you know, I did it. I don't know if it worked or not, but it kind of it took my mind off the stress. But here is what David's going to want to answer. How do you deal with stress? Say no to something, baby. <laughs> Just say no. <laughs> no. Yeah, so can, can you relight the fourth act? No. no. <laughs> I have one word, Xanax. That helps. No, uh, seriously. We had several uh, sponsors that deal with stress at the tech table. I can't think of them offhand. One thing that I do is I stand. I will not sit at the table. I will stand. And not all the time, but sometimes when I start getting a little bit tight, I'll just stand and I'll, and I'll light the show from a standing position. Now, there are two reasons to do this. One is the stretch, like Steve has mentioned, but also you see the floor better. And I always watch the floor when I'm lighting shows because I like to see the shadows and I want to see what the floor is doing and I like to paint the floor with light. But that being said, you have to stay calm because as Steve said, things are going to be changing during that entire technical lighting process. And it's up to you to pull the show together. So if you really want to think about it, you can get totally stressed out because that show is dependent on on you pulling it together and making the finishing touches and solving problems, like Steve said. Also, one other thing that Steve said that was really smart is don't try to solve big problems if you're stressed out. He's absolutely right. I do this all the time. 
I like say, okay, I'm not really ready to relight Act 4 right now. I have time later today to do it. So I'm going to just do these simple notes first. And usually once you get into the groove, then you're, then you're relaxed. Once you get through that first hour, you're totally relaxed. And then you can take on the bigger projects. And sometimes you even think of answers while you're doing something else. So yeah, that, those are all great suggestions, Steve. Yes to what Steve said, and yes to most of what David said. And I would just add, and, and Steve got on this. The first thing Steve said was breathe, right? And I think you guys were making fun of me about a year ago when I told you I had started meditating again. Because what you're talking about is stress is when your mind is doing something that you don't want it to do. And it's focusing on something that you don't want it to do. And that really takes a certain discipline. Now, a year, many years ago, decades ago, I was a big meditator and into that. And I, and I lost that for a while because I got so wrapped up in my career and I forgot to take the time to keep the mind trained. So now that we're in the tw early 21st century... I don't have to go to class to meditate. I don't have to go to a meditation group. I got an app for that. So I've got this app that I actually spent the money and subscribed to called Headspace. And I do it every day. 20 minutes of doing exactly what Steve said. Breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth, closing the eyes, taking some time. It just take my mind is more focused now than it's been in a long time, and I'm less stressed out, even in stressful situations, because my because it's it's just reminding me that a thought is just a thought. I don't have to identify with that thought. That thought can come and go, and when you hang on to that thought, then it starts to stress you out. And so it's been it's been really great for me. Every, every day I come home after work, I sit down, put the headphones in. I pick, I pick up the app, Headspace, do some time with it. I'm a much happier person. So our friend Drew Belinsky asks, Hi guys, I'm a freelance artist who simply cannot afford to drop $3,000 on Vectorworks. Is it okay to use LX Free, Drafty, or Paint to send plots? Or should I just bite the bullet and invest in Vectorworks? Let me just tell you something about investing in Vectorworks. Vectorworks happens to be one of the main standards in lighting software, the other being AutoCAD. And it depends on where you work, obviously. If you work in Europe, most of it is AutoCAD. And if you're working in the United States, it's usually Vectorworks. Now, just looking at it in a black and white situation, I think that whatever tool that you use that's going to present a professional quality drawing is fine because in most cases you send a light plot off to the electrician or to the theater and uh, and if it looks professional and it uses all the conventional uh, symbols and everything else then I don't think that electrician cares. Where it makes a difference is if you're working at a place where the electrician or anyone the resident lighting designer there whoever has to go in and edit it then you got to make sure that Drafty or whatever program you're using, that file is compatible with Vectorworks or AutoCAD because not doing that does look unprofessional, okay? So I really don't care if it says Vectorworks on... As a matter of fact, most people aren't going to know unless they look at the file extension of what type of program you used. But in the case of uh, working with people that may have to access that program one way or another or that file, then yes, I think you ought to invest in Vectorworks and AutoCAD. Let me just go back. when I, Before there was CAD drafting and I did a union exam and I came in with my light plots and some of them were, I was starting to get into CAD and the response was, you know, we don't, this was at the union in the 1980s. We don't really accept CAD drafting here. We really expect you to do it by hand. We don't think CAD will ever really get to catch on in our business because you really can't see the whole drawing all at once and take in the whole picture. You need to be at a drafting table. Well, famous last words. That changed, obviously. Okay, so I think there's a sort of a dogmatic thing that once you're in it, it's hard to move away from it. And then there's this other thing. It's perceptual, right? So do you look like a professional? Well, all the professionals use this. Therefore, that must be the thing. Until somebody comes along and disrupts that. So I think that uh, we're going through this phase. Um, investing money, 
I, I think, you know, one of the reasons that I, let's just be honest, I specify a lot of ETC equipment in my work. They have proven to me that when something goes wrong, they're going to bend over backwards to make it right. They're not the only company that does that, so I'm not just calling them out. There are others who are also wonderful. So the company also has to, once they've got you, so they might invest in you in the early days, and then once they've got you, and you, it's, easy, it's not easy for you to move your money or move your, move your whole life, to plots, designs, you have a lot of information that's now locked into that software. And to make a change is hard. Well, sometimes maybe even impossible. So the question is, are they still investing in you? Are they still caring about the customer? And that is not just about drafting. That's in general as a business approach. So uh, I will say this about Drafty. We have adopted it here at the University of Florida. It cost us $1,200 for a year for unlimited number of licenses. So, so that anybody I, I want, I just send them an email and boom, they log in with it. The, unfortunately, they have to use their Google account to do it, which I'm not so thrilled about. But for entry level people to get to learn the basics, it's good. If you're a professional, you know, it's like David says, it's something else. If you are giving them the CAD file that's going to need to be in Vectorworks, it is the standard. We can't, it has become the standard. It wasn't the standard always. It's just become it. Okay, if you're getting back to Drew's question, I'm going to agree with David. Also, you know, you have to look at how other people view you. So it's not so much a producer or a director who's looking at your light plot. It again, it is that master electrician at that theater. So if they get a plot from you, and drafty can be wonderful, but if they get that plot and the perception is you're an amateur, you're going to have right. to overcome that once you arrive at the theater. Secondly, you know you may or may not be interested in assisting, but if you're assisting uh, most lighting designers, they're going to ask for competency in uh, Lightwrite, right? N- not Excel spreadsheet, or right. they're going to ask for competency in Vectorworks, not in Drafty. So you're going to have to work in the tools of the industry that you want to excel in. And I agree, three thousand dollars is a lot. But this is your business, and you would be investing that same amount of money or more if you were an Uber driver or if you were opening up a barber shop or a, a, you know, whatever. Right. You, you have to invest in your business. And I think biting the bullet and saving and getting uh, Vectorworks is the way to go. Perception carries the day. Yep. So you do have to be concerned about, about how you're going to be perceived right, in terms of the quality of the work and what you work in. And, and unfortunately, that's just, that's just life. Uh, the, per, the perception, whether or not the other program does a fantastic job or not. You, people, well, it's, it's, it's more, it's more other, than just this, perception. It is walking into a theater, and they have a grand MA, and you say, well, I know something that's better that's cheaper. Okay, next. You know, you walk into the scene shop, and they've got a, a CNC router. And you go, well, I know something. I can use a jigsaw. Next. So there's a point that technology is always on the move. And if we don't uh, pursue it, then we're going to be left in the, uh, the shadows. This is really fascinating. And it's so true. And I'm so glad we're talking about it because it is perception. Uh, listen, it's hard enough when you're a young designer to get people's respect for you as an artist and a technician. And, uh, but I would not leave anything to chance. Let me just say this. There's a danger of elitism. Like, this is the best, and this is what we do, and this is how it's done, and it, and it becomes a certain level of... If, if we all sort of always buy into that 100%, then uh, it's nothing It's not elitism. It's and then not, you get, Stan. When you think about it, it's you're just conforming to what the industry standard is. No, I'm all for standards, but I'm just saying when somebody somebody comes along with a better way to do something or a different way to do something, that's innovation. All I know is that if I had a resume in front of me of someone who wanted to be my assistant and under tools that said drafty and it doesn't say Vectorworks, I would not hire him. <laughs> right. I, would, I wouldn't. I, would I, hire I agree. Him. And then to me, and Stan, I, listen, I totally agree. Innovation is important. We have to encourage it. But we're talking survival here. This business is hard enough to get into and get accepted for you to make a conscious decision to buck the system like that, the buck convention. It's really, to me, self-destructive for a young designer to do that. Well, in case you didn't know, 
You all are listening to Light Talk with Steve, Stan, and David, and we are the Lumen Brothers. And this week, Light Talk is sponsored by, from the same makers of Pizza Packy Pizza Spinner, the Whammock Corporation introduces a product that will save your career. Alex, the crazy director babblefish. Are meetings with directors making you more frustrated every day? Why do so many directors mask their true intentions by describing their visions with obtuse phrases like, I think this moment needs to free the audience's wild and dark visions of adolescent trauma. What the hell does that mean? It's obvious that you need Wamit's new Alex the Crazy Director Babblefish. When inserted into your ear canal, this tiny device will translate what these pretentious artistes really want to say. The device can also be used with the standard headset system so that you can enjoy private translations during lighting sessions. The director says, I need to feel that her personality is entering another dimension. Alex translates, The adult is asking you to add shin kickers into this queue. The director says, That scene needs more romance. Alex translates, She wants lots of tacky go bows. The director says, I need the light to help establish the clarity of the dialogue. Alex translates, This fool wants more front light. Order now and receive our new Alex the Crazy Director Babblefish app. Loaded into your favorite iOS device, you can now receive instant translations of artistically obtuse language during Skype and production meetings. End your artistic language frustrations today with Whammit Corporation's Alex the Crazy Director Babblefish. And remember, Alex makes a great gift for Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and even Festivus. For the rest of us. For the rest of us. <laughs> and now, back to Light Talk. So that duck sound means that it's time for our Let's Talk About segment. And today, Stan is going to introduce our topic. So uh, we've been going through portfolio re- reviews at our university, and, and people go through that whether you're looking for a job or whether you're at school. So we thought, what can students and faculty and all of us learn from portfolio reviews about how to do them? So I have a new colleague at the university who's a costume designer, and she said something that I thought was really brilliant the other day, and I'm, gonna, I, I'm trying to get her to write it down because it, I thought it was really insightful. And we were talking to a student who about how to respond in fittings, which for costume folks is you know, pretty, kind of a stressful time and a real learning opportunity for student designers. And she said, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what she said and see if I can get it as, as accurate as possible, but she said something like, we, the faculty sort of perceive that you, the students, think that when we question your choice, that somehow we are making a judgment about that choice and, or that we think the choice is wrong or that we think the choice should be something else, which then puts the student in the position of feeling like they have to defend or justify or explain their choice, when in fact, That's not the reason we're asking the question. We're asking the question so that you can reflect upon your choice, be able to explain your reasoning or instincts behind that choice, and then allows us to understand you better, how you made that choice, and then perhaps by then responding to that, lead you towards more sophisticated, more refined, more polished choices in the future. And I thought that was a really good observation that it's not a, a judgment. And, and, and so to kind of correct that perception on the part of students when faculty are questioning design decisions that students are making. What do you guys think? Well, I'm really surprised we're even talking about this, but that just shows you how times have changed. And I'm not going to make a judgment here. I'm just going to give you the facts of what it was like like 30 years ago when we were in graduate school, or at least when I was, I, I just can only talk about my own experiences. And what, and what has happened now? My master teachers were people like Bill Eckhart and Jean Eckhart and Alan Heaton and Ming Cho Lee, and even some of the designers I worked with right out of grad school, like Gilbert and Neil and people like that. There was a respect that we gave these uh, amazing teachers that we would never even question what their intentions were. 
some of them were very harsh, no doubt about it. But we understood that as long as we were in that program, these teachers believed in us. All right. And we respected that. And, and we would never question their motives. I think that things have changed quite a bit. And students have changed quite a bit, at least in the last 25 years that I've, 20, almost 30 years actually now that I've been teaching grad students. I think a lot of students now are a lot more sensitive and in a good way are not afraid to speak up. I think that's good. I really do. But I think students need to trust their teachers to know that their intentions are always, or at least should be always, to help that student. So uh, instead of like questioning really what your motives are, is just finding out or, or taking that, ex- that experience as an internal valuable l- a learning lesson. And like Stan said, a lot of it has to do with your reaction. Find out if you cri- can critically think your way into an alternative way of doing something. That is probably a very, that's a very important tool to learn, especially as a lighting designer, because if you're sitting there and you, even if you have your crazy director babble fish in your ear <laughs> and the director is, you know, asking you, you know, to, to, to create some trauma on stage <laughs> somehow with the lights, you need to be able to critically analyze that question or that suggestion and come up with an answer. Yeah. Uh, I remember John Gleason used to say, you're embarrassing me. Uh, this, is, this is the worst work I've ever seen in my life. Well, nothing like Ming telling me that my platform design was so ugly, even he couldn't draw it. You know. Now I knew when Ming said that to me that he said it with love. He really did, and and I think the great teachers are able to do that. You know, I didn't make anyone cry this year. We do uh, <laughs> we do reviews twice a year, um, and so no one cried this year. But I, you know. I think it's it's just about the work. It's it's not about the personality. Sure. I mean, we have faculty and we have students who don't like each other. We have faculty and students who have personality quirks. We have faculty and students who are not very good. But at the end of the day, um, it is about the work, and that's what the conversation is about. And if, I mean, it's hard, but grad school is hard. You know, check your feelings at the door. Yeah. Um, it's it's three short years, and you're there in competition with other students. And I try to uh, argue that really you're only in competition with yourself. Right. But it, it, it is uh, natural, I think, to want to be the best in class or certainly not be the last in class. But I, I, I agree with David. I mean, people are sensitive. Get over it. You're, you're going to go out and work in the theater, and someone's going to say, I don't like the blue psych. Well, change the damn thing uh, to, to a different color or do something, but don't sit there and, and, and stress over it. Um, Edward Albee used to come here, and he would critique our design students. And he would come in, and they would have spent a month working on an Edward Albee play. They all did different plays. So he showed up, first time he came, he showed up and they had all of their models and their costumes and their sketches and everything was laid out. It was like, you know, presenting it to God. And he came in the room and he looked at the first one and said, this is very good. I, I, this is great. This is great. And he went around the room and people were kind of surprised because he kept saying things like, this is wonderful work. I, I love what you've done here. And then he finished and he said, this is just some of the most spectacular work I've ever seen. I just want to be clear. It's completely wrong for all of my plays, but it's really <laughs> nice work. <laughs> so, there you, go. you know, no one sat in the room and went, oh, what does he really mean? <laughs> he <laughs> said what he really meant. Right. So I, That's funny. You know, grad, grad school is not for everybody. And I, I, I sometimes... Uh, uh, I worry if we – it can happen at any age, but I like to have students who've been out of school for three or four years before they come back. That yeah, makes sense. Be- yeah. Because they come back and they're a little bit more confident in who they are and uh, a little less uh, apprehensive. They're, they're, they should be proving something to themselves, not everyone else in the room. So I, 
I think these midterm and end-of-the-year evaluations have to be uh, – they don't have to be brutal, but I think they have to be pretty frank, and, and people can't get too bent out of shape about it. Otherwise, if you're not getting honestly critiqued for your work, if I'm sitting there worrying about uh, if I'm going to hurt your feelings, yep. the problem. Or, then, then that is a problem. Yep. Yeah. See, we don't even do them. We only have evaluations at the end of the year. Anything that comes up is usually on a one-to-one thing with me and the student. It's just that's just the way we do it now. I'm not saying that's the way to do it. I just find it interesting that a lot of people are going that now. Well, I think that one to one thing has to happen every week, right? So right. I think I think you're onto something there. Yeah, we do. We yeah. do. We, we do. All of my students are assigned to. They take credit for their design work, and they have to meet with me once a week. We call it stand time. Okay, Debbie from Southern California, probably one of David's <laughs> students, it says says my teacher said I do not understand how to use layers of light. Can you walk me through this? What does he mean? You could just ask me. She could have asked you. Why didn't she ask David? <laughs> She's not my student. Oh. I was just joking. <laughs> well, yeah. I think uh, when we talk about layers of light, that can mean a couple different things, but I'm going to focus on uh, one definition. So I suggest there are three layers of light. The first is ambient light, and I would call that uh, the general light of the scene. It's lights that blend in tone. It's the foundation of the cue, perhaps, on which everything else is built. The second would be accent, and that creates visual interest. Um, Those are the lights that highlight or serve as the key light, and those can help establish time, location, or mood. And finally, I would say they're specials, and that focuses our attention to a specific moment or action, and that's used as uh, part of the selective focus method to uh, take an audience and have them look at a specific area on stage. So I think ambient light um, can be wash lights, it can be pars or fresnels. I think accent light usually is an ERS. And specials can be a combination of anything, but usually we think of a special as something tightly focused. So most often I think that's an ERS. So used in combination, those three layers work to uh, create the mood on stage. So I would say to sum up, lighting designers use a number of light sources. Uh, in layers, and those are at varied angles, uh, color, softness levels, intensity, uh, distribution, movement, contrast, brightness levels, which means that when we're working with actors on stage, it's lighting that highlights each moment of the actor's work on the stage. So audiences usually have to bring a little imagination to the theater, and I would say good lighting or good layers of lighting assist in telling a story. I think that's pretty good, Steve, uh, uh, and I would agree, and I would just throw, it, throw in a sort of from the architectural perspective, for those who are interested in architectural lighting, those th- they might be like Steve's three layers, but I might describe them like this. There's the direct light, there's the indirect light, and then there's the sparkle. So one is the light that you know where the directionality is coming from, it's direct, uh, the second would be the ambient, as Steve described it, or the bounce light, the reflected light, the indirect light. And then the third would be the things that make it really pretty. Or the, uh, like Steve says, the points that makes it, makes it in, uh, visual interest. Sparkle would be another word to use for that. You see, I, and I think of layers of light totally different. So you got, <laughs> if she was my student, the way I was ex- express it is as layers of light is like layers of light in an atmosphere as you're looking into a three-dimensional type of atmosphere that you've created for the moment. You know, and, and you see through these layers and actors travel through the layers. Uh, but that's just the way I think about that's layers. Nice. I think you're right. I think there's a yeah. lot of ways. So, I mean... Um, I just think there's a lot of ways to do this. So yeah. being able uh, to say, let me explain what your teacher is talking about, <laughs> Good luck. That's, that's kind of fool's <laughs> error in there yeah. uh, because we have no idea what he or she is really talking about. True. Exactly. And speaking of not knowing what we're talking about, it's that us. Hammond organ solo <laughs> tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to the Fools on Light Talk. <laughs> anyway, be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk fun. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. Now just remember this important point, that if you decide to litigate us, the law firm of Tungsten, Phosphor, and Filament 
I think Filament's on his way out, will defend us until our retirement <laughs> funds are depleted. Maybe it's Tungsten who's on his way out. <laughs> no, Filament's out. <laughs> and Tungsten. Oh my God, will they have You're one more? You're going to have to find a new law firm, <laughs> aren't we? Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Gainesville, and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to tune in next week for our annual Christmas extravaganza. And somehow we'll figure out a Christmas sponsor. <laughs> Light Talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor all around this world. So we'll all see you next Saturday morning. Bye-bye from Light Talk. Adios, senores. And senores.